Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kate Samino, and I have the pleasure of serving as the executive director of the Citizens League. Uh, Citizens League is here with Center for Rural Policy and Development as your co-host for this interconnected series, and I could not be happier to be part of that team. We developed the interconnected series um, as a way to explore how some of these policy issues that are showing up in both rural and urban areas have a lot in common, but there's also some really interesting nuances between, between the different parts of our state. And we know that we are truly interconnected and wanted to take some time to dig in and explore deeper on some of these policy issues. Today's event is on workforce and it is of course a startlingly gorgeous day here in Minnesota. So if you are here, we know that you really care about Minnesota's workforce. You have passed the bar, you have exceeded expectations. Uh, thank you for being here. We've got uh, close to hundred folks online already and more are rolling in by the second. So really pleased to have you all here. Um, I am uh, pleased to be here representing the Citizens League as one of the partners for this event. Citizens League is a nearly 70 year old organization. We are nonpartisan, or as I like to say, multipartisan. We are an independent nonprofit. We're based in St. Paul, but work statewide. And Citizens League believes in the power of people to use their voice, their insights to shape policy issues that affect our communities and to design and create better solutions that can create a stronger Minnesota and stronger communities all around our state. So uh, we are really thrilled to be here uh, as part of our policy series, policy work, leadership development and event series, this interconnected uh, idea really fits so perfectly into what we are trying to accomplish with conversation and exploration of different policy issues. So our, our event today, you know, we're on Zoom, we've got the chat open. You can adjust your chat so you can see it and feel free to put in questions that you may have, comments, and you um, just know that we'll be getting to those as we move through the program. And it is my pleasure next to turn it over to Julie Tesh to introduce the Center for Rural Policy and Development and speak a little bit about their role in this series. And thank you, Julie, for being a great partner. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you to the Citizens League and you and your staff for being a wonderful partner as well. Um, and welcome everyone to the second conversation in our series. We had such a successful one uh, last month on childcare and we, it, we have another great uh, schedule and agenda with speakers for you today. And we heard so many wonderful things from the last discussion just on being able to try and just come together and learn from one another about common situations. And like Kate said, the nuances that are between the different populations. And so, you know, we view this as a time, you know, for, for everyone to learn about each other's, um, what they're facing in policy wise and workforce. And I can guarantee you that the one thing that everyone will say is, we need workers, lots and lots of workers. We have that in common, I can promise you that. And so we're really excited today to have um, just a great panel for you from all over the state, um, whether it's healthcare or whether it's training, um, just really excited. But before we get going, I just want to uh, talk quickly about the Center for Rural Policy and Development. We are also a nonprofit, just like the Citizens League. And we have a really cool uh, mission and what we do, we are the only one in Minnesota that does it. We do research on rural Minnesota policy issues. That's what we do. I think we do it quite well. Um, but you know, every year we put together a thought leader survey. We're actually getting it together right now to go out to thought leaders. So influencers around the state telling us what's going on in their, in their areas and what are they seeing and they take the survey. And from there, we put together what we're going to research. And so then we take that and we research those questions and we present it to decision makers. So whether it's legislators, county commissioners, you know, any, any decision maker to give them that lens of what it looks like in rural. And so I think it's pretty cool. So again, you know, we're non-biased, non-partisan, or I guess, Kate, did you say multi-partisan? Uh, same, very much the same. And so it's just a natural synergy for us to partner with Citizens League on this interconnected series. So this is, has just been great. And um, I'm going to turn it over to our research associate, Kelly Ash, who um, is our workforce researcher. And he's going to go through some of our research and then he's going to, uh, we'll be having our panel discussion then. 
So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Julie. Hi, everybody. My name is Kelly Ash. I'm the Research Associate for the Center for Rural Policy and Development. I've been the one kind of doing a bunch of research on the workforce shortage, specifically in rural Minnesota, and I kind of want to provide a foundation on just what we're talking about. And I'm going to present quite a bit of information here. Uh, the idea for you guys and the, the folks in the audience here is not necessarily to remember everything, but to get an idea of the complexity and the amount of activity that's occurring all across Minnesota to try and solve this issue and why it is such a big issue. So let's get started. Let's take about 20 minutes and then we'll get into the, the fun part with the panelists. So let's break real quick. As a state in Minnesota, there's some key things we need to keep in mind and why workforce is kind of stressing everybody out first. We are the top five lowest unemployment rate almost continuously in the country. Almost every year we are in the top five, no matter if we're in a pandemic, no matter if we're in a recession, um, we have some of the lowest unemployment rates in the entire country. We, have, uh, we are continually in top five highest labor force participation rate in the country. Um, we are almost always the top performing state during a recession, uh, whenever there's a massive recession in the country, Minnesota, although impacted, uh, rarely gets impacted more than uh, any other state. Uh, we typically outperform nearly everyone. And we have the fifth most diverse economy in the country. And if you want more information, the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce Foundation put together the Minnesota 2030 report, which kind of lays out some really kind of cool overview and oversights uh, or sort of some cool, cool uh, overview of the rural economy, which is really worth uh, checking out. So why are we awesome, right? And I just want to hammer this home. It's because we are interconnected. It's because I, you're, this uh, Minnesota's diverse economy exists because we have metropolitan, urban, and rural areas all interconnected and doing their work. We have agriculture, we have mining, we have IT, we have healthcare, we have education, we have a lot of stuff. And this is rare. Most states don't have this kind of economy and this kind of connectedness. Uh, that exists in this country. And so it's really, really important. And I want to hammer this home because we receive a lot of mixed messages. And I'm just going to use two different, uh, this is from the Star Tribune. And this is quite old now. This is 2012, I believe. This was uh, this uh, article on the left here, headline the Sunday uh, newspaper, I forget the date, but it was right before legislative session started that year. And it's an urban rural split and Minnesota grows deeper and wider, right? And people in the L, so whenever anybody talks about the L, they're talking about the Western and Southern portion of Minnesota, uh, tend to be older per capita than more populated areas and make less money. More still make their living farming the land or in agriculture linked activities. Homes and businesses are scattered widely across the landscape and property values are lower yielding a weaker tax base. And this entire article was talking about how the legislature is facing this economic crisis or this lag in the economy that's occurring apparently in rural Minnesota. On the right here is this uh, another article in the Star Tribune that was published on the exact same day as the one on the left. And it says rural counties in Minnesota leading the economic recovery. And the, the counties that they highlighted were all on the western side of the state or in the L. Um, and so we need to figure out what it is we're talking about. And again, there's many areas to Minnesota. We are all kind of interconnected and it occurs quite frequently that we um, that when one portion of the state isn't doing as well, another portion of the state's kind of picking up the slack and doing quite well. And that will flip flop during a recession or any sort of kind of economic boom. And that's just how Minnesota has been operating for 50 to 60 years now. And it's why we continue to do so well. So what may threaten our awesomeness? Um, so two things. Now I'll point out this whole thing is about labor force trends. So labor force growth has been decreasing for two decades. And in fact, even before the pandemic began um, was the first year that we had more people leave the labor force than enter into it. So we are on a negative trajectory now uh, for labor force trends, which is uh, not good. Um, we're terrible at keeping youth. And this just isn't a rural issue. This is statewide. We are not good at keeping our young people. In fact, out of the net out migration, uh, out migration of, of the population, two thirds of it are between the ages of 18 and 24. Uh, so that's statewide. Uh, our metropolitan areas aren't great at retaining their youth either. Uh, in fact, they're really good at getting the rural youth to come there. Um, and that's kind of the interplay that you tend to see. The last thing I'll say is immigration policy. Uh, federal immigration policy has not been good. Um, and a lot of our labor force trends and a lot of our population trends, particularly in rural areas, based on our immigration policy, whether we can get immigrant and refugee populations into our communities uh, to work and to be a part of our communities and to be a part of our state. And uh, this is a big impact. 
So what we're seeing now in economic development is a fundamental shift. We're no longer talking about business recruitment. And it's interesting because even in the last election cycle, we still heard legislators talking about, I'm going to bring jobs to the area. And really, that's the last thing we should be talking about right now uh, when we're talking about economic development. What we're actually talking about is people recruitment or resident recruitment, and this is a statewide issue. Um, it was I was all planning on talking about how we lost in congressional seat uh, uh, over the last census, and fortunately, that didn't happen. We kept our congressional seat, but just by a hair, I think 89 votes or 29 votes, I forget what it was. Uh, but again, this is a statewide issue. This is, isn't rural. Um, we're a slow growth state. So let's talk about job, job vacancies. Uh, at the Center for Rural Policy and Development, we've been doing this research for about four or five years now. Um, and it really came from state legislators talk, you know, they were hearing a lot of anecdotal information from their businesses about, hey, we need workers. And there was a lot of information and there's always that kind of really prominent narrative that the seven county metro or metropolitan areas in general in Minnesota um, had workforce shortages. There were a lot of jobs, a lot of opportunities. That narrative exists, but this idea that there was a need for workers in real, rural areas was a little bit different. That kind of went against that kind of prominent narrative that we have that there are no opportunities in rural areas. And so we had an opportunity to dig into all the data and um, uh, thank goodness DEED, uh, a fantastic state agency, actually puts that information together to look at job vacancies. So this is what it looks like. This is a, a chart for the job vacancy rate. Now the job vacancy rate is the number of job vacancies as a percentage of total filled jobs in a region. The higher the percentage, that means the higher it is, the, the harder it is, more challenging it's gonna be to fill a job because there's just that many job vacancies compared to how many jobs are actually exist in that region. And you can see here, um, the seven county metro is this red line, they are, uh, they did pretty well. Um, we consider a 3% job vacancy rate to be a pretty healthy clip. Um, uh, and as you can see, since uh, uh, we're starting around 2015 and onwards, we were we had places, uh, read planning regions in Minnesota that were above 6%. It was insane. And what should be a little bit striking about this chart is that regions outside of the seven county metro actually had a higher job vacancy rate than the seven county metro did. Uh, and that's been what we've been seeing since 2010. And you can see that dip during the Great Recession, an increase. And even by 2020, uh, when we were hitting a pandemic, um, we still stayed well above 3%. Uh, so that's really, really significant. And that's a really big deal. There was a lot of narrative around um, employers having to increase their wages in order to attract workers. And that is a piece, absolutely. Um, no one, I think, is going to be outside of the business owners themselves are gonna be uh, against uh, wages increases. But what the data shows is that the employers are doing some significant work in increasing the wages because there's competition for labor now. Uh, and as you can see, again, uh, this red line is a seven county metro and they've been pretty flat and only recently have started to see increases. This is median wages, by the way, of job vacancies. Um, but what's interesting here is in 2005, you'll see this huge gap between the seven county metro and then all the other regions in the state. And you can see the largest increases have actually taken place outside of the seven county metro to the point where we're getting pretty darn close. That gap is, has shrunk pretty significantly um, across the state and kind of evening the playing field as far as wages. Now, they are still a little bit lower uh, outside of seven county metro, but they are competitive, particularly when you take into consideration the cost of living. So when we did the data, the data is incredibly clear on this. Um, the pressure to fill job vacancies in greater Minnesota is at or exceeds levels experienced in the Twin Cities. And it's important to know that even the Twin Cities is experiencing high pressure to fill job vacancies. So this is a really significant issue. Gap in wages has narrowed. Uh, so they are increasing, but also narrowing at the same time between regions. There's a significantly larger number of these job vacancies that are full-time. Um, this is the most full-time job vacancies we've ever seen since we started measuring this back in 2005. Um, that's just the way it is. Significantly larger number of job vacancies are offering health insurance benefits. Again, more than ever recorded, <laughs> uh, the number of job vacancies offering health insurance benefits. And then the other thing, um, a lot of times that gets a little confusing is that they, we'll look at uh, this job vacancy data and look at the percentage of jobs that require a secondary education and be like, oh, if they don't require a secondary education, obviously they're low skilled jobs. And what we found looking at the data and doing interviews in the field is that actually that is very far from the truth. What actually happens is that job requirements, particularly for education, are used as a lever. And so let's look at construction. Uh, uh, for example, uh, during the Great Recession, when you know housing stopped uh, and a lot of construction workers got laid off, any job vacancies that opened up for construction 
um, they would put on the job application that uh, higher secondary education or whatever required in order to apply because they knew employers knew they had a huge pool of people to draw from. So they, inc they pulled that lever and just said, well, we're just going to get the folks that have secondary education. Now, when there is no pool to draw from, they're like, we don't care. We'll train them on the spot. They don't need that secondary education. And so they took those requirements away. And you see that a lot uh, in the job vacancy data of this kind of ebbing and flowing of those types of levers. So the next question you probably have is COVID-19. Obviously, that probably had a significant impact on this whole situation. So we dug through the data again, and surprisingly, no, we are still facing a workforce shortage, particularly healthcare practitioners and technical, community and social services, architecture and engineering, life science and social sciences. This is across the state. This isn't just metro based. This isn't just seven county metro. This is every region in the state is facing severe shortages in almost every occupation, except for food prep and serving related, sales and related, and office and administrative support. These ones on the left here. Not, you know, probably not too surprising. These are the businesses that were impacted the most uh, by the pandemic as well. Now, what's interesting about this is um, um, from a workforce development perspective, you know, a lot, this could be a stressful opportunity, but there's a lot of workforce development organizations that are looking at this as an opportunity to, and we finally have a pool of workers again to kind of engage in and maybe start retraining to take on some of these other kinds of occupations that one may pay more or two have more, I would say, social benefits uh, uh, to our state as a whole than maybe the jobs that they were uh, working in. And the other thing I'll say is when we look at projections in these occupations across the state, again, if we break it down by region, this is a long term issue. This is not a short term problem. This is going to continue. We're going to have workforce shortages and we may likely have kind of a pool of workers to engage from in these occupations for for a few years now. So we have to figure out how do we fill in this gap? Um, and there's really kind of two pots and I'm going to go into detail a little bit about these. Um, and again, it's gonna be a lot of information, but They'll give you a sense of what's going on. We have to recruit and retain labor force, and we have to engage populations with high barriers to employment. So let's see what that looks like. And we did a three-part series here. I'm going to go through each of these, just a few slides on each to kind of give you a sense of what the heck we're talking about here. So part two is resident recruitment and retention. This is a, a new thing for rural Minnesota, although the Twin Cities has been doing this for a while, and I call it the rural envy. When uh, rural Minnesota workforce development organizations and economic development organizations started talking about resident recruitment, Greater MSP was always what everybody pointed at and said, we want that in our region. We want that website and that network and that kind of thing pulled together for each region in rural Minnesota so we can talk about the jobs we have and what it's like to live and work here and do all these things. Uh, and so Greater MSP always gets a lot of credit, particularly from uh, outside the region, uh, as some of the great work that they're doing. And, and a lot of folks are trying to kind of mimic that idea uh, in rural Minnesota. And there are some things happening in rural Minnesota. This map uh, from the University of Minnesota Extension, uh, they do their whole marketing hometown America. They have a whole program on this for rural uh, communities and regions to help to, uh, implement resident recruitment strategies. And there's a few that have started. This is an older map and it's kind of funny. Some of these don't exist now, some of these initiatives, but you can kind of get a sense that, you know, uh, rural Minnesota and greater Minnesota is starting to think about these initiatives and, and do some really interesting work. And so if you see some of these things, uh, that's what it's based on is resident recruitment efforts. And it's not as if the uh, greater Minnesota is just trying to do something that has, you know, they're not playing off a of strength because actually this, this idea of resident recruitment is playing off this idea of what has been coined, which I dislike, is called the brain gain, right? It's the opposite of the brain drain. So we all know about uh, the fact that rural areas tend to lose 18 to 29 year olds to the metropolitan areas. That's just a, it's a statewide trend. It's a nationwide trend. Heck, it might even be a uh, first world country global trend, right? Um, and so that's happening uh, in a lot of fret is done over this. We hear rural communities talk about, oh, how can we keep our young? How can we keep our young? While at the same time, ignoring this other trend, which University of Minnesota Extension has detailed uh, uh, really, really well, which is the in-migration of 30 to 49 year olds. So even though rural counties are really bad at keeping their young, they do a really good job at gaining those 30 to 49 year olds um, um, that isn't really tracked very well. And this is occurring even though rural areas aren't even trying. There are really no initiatives to take advantage of this trend. And you can look at uh, University of Minnesota Extension if you Google brain gain. Um, 
uh, th this research will pop up and it's really quite fascinating. And it's what all this people recruitment, resident recruitment in rural areas is based on is this idea. How do we, how do we engage these folks? The uh, Upper Minnesota Valley RDC, which is in uh, West Central Minnesota, which is probably the region that has uh, experienced the most significant population decline over the past 30 to 40 years. Uh, their Regional Development Commission put together their own kind of initiative that's doing resident recruitment. Uh, it's called Get Rural MN. And I use this as kind of a give you an idea of like all the different components that go into recruiting a resident, right? So we need to talk about housing, the employment opportunities, the things to do, family essentials, kind of what Greater, MS, uh, what greater MSP was trying to do or is doing. Uh, is gathering all that in a centralized place. So not only people that are looking for things um, can do, but also for the employers in their region to use when they're interviewing potential employees, uh, uh, potential candidates and say, hey, we know you'll like this job, but we also think you'll like this community. And here's some really interesting resources to help you find housing. Here's some really interesting things to do. Uh, and that's kind of the components that go into this. There are some challenges with this, and I, I think Greater MSP could speak really well to this since they kind of got up and running. I'm sure they went through a lot of this, but in rural areas, it's about it's a, four main things that really come up. One is uh, building this content, this information, this network from scratch. So you're trying to engage housing folks, you're trying to engage parks, you're trying to engage employers, you're trying to engage all these pieces in the community to build a network to get it functioning so that there's kind of like this centralized place in which all the stuff is stored. That's really, really challenging. On top of that, there's really no clear cut answer as to who should be responsible for this. Is this a tourism thing? Is this economic development? Is this a county thing? Or is it larger than a county? Is it a larger regional thing? There's really has not been a good answer to that as of yet. There's also the negative narrative and perceptions that rural er uh, that people have of rural areas that need to be overcome that a lot of folks are trying to figure out. Um, how do we get through those perceptions and those narratives? And then the last thing is the diversity of skill set required for these initiatives. So we're trying to implement an initiative to have resident recruitment, but also uh, to fill in some workforce shortages we have while we need the skills to implement those initiatives, right? Um, and so that's kind of, it, it becomes kind of a vicious cycle as far as implementing those ideas. Just a couple more slides here. Uh, this part three is engaging populations with high barriers to employment. Really, really fascinating topic. Um, and when we talk about high barriers to employment, uh, specifically in this report, we were kind of talking about four different um, populations. So folks with disabilities, folks that might have a criminal background history, Immigrant and refugee populations, although I would say refugee populations, probably more than immigrant. And then uh, just populations that have certain life circumstances. This could be poverty, could be a single parent. Um, those types of situations that just make it hard to, uh, to get employed and to be a part of that. So the really interesting thing about this work in order to understand where workforce development organizations are coming on this is to understand that there's two sides to this barrier. So obviously there's the population side. So can the potential uh, workforce get transportation, childcare, do they have healthcare access? If they're in poverty, these things become very, very challenging. There's language, there's all kinds of reasons why the population might be facing barriers to enter into it. But there's also this business side that I think is really interesting, maybe gets a little overlooked, is concern over cost. So if I'm going to hire somebody with a disability, what kind of capital improvements do I have to put into my facility in order to make that assess, uh, as accessible as possible? And if I hire this person, am I opening myself up to legal liability, right? These are kinds of typical questions that a business might have. Lack of awareness that these populations are a great source of employ uh, employees. Cultural preparedness uh, within their own staff. If we are hiring folks that aren't, you know, of the kind of typical culture that you already have uh, hired in your facility. And then just flat out negative perceptions that folks might have of these populations as far as being good workers. Um, and so some of these barriers on that end needs to be taken care of. So workforce development, then if we look at it kind of like an ecosystem, and I wanna thank uh, Jessica Miller for sending this, this is kind of a deed slide. You can really look at it this way, right? So employers are kind of in the middle and then you have all the stuff on the side. 
So we have industry association chambers, chamber of commerces. We have local planning boards or workforce development boards. They're funded through WIOA, the Workforce Improvement and Opportunity Act, through federal money. They exist. You have DEED and the career force programs. We have education, higher education and all the educational partners, even high schools. Um, Department of Labor, we have initiative foundations, we have city and county economic development organizations, we have regional development commissions, and then we have the overarching regional alliance that tries to tie all of these things together, right? We have an ecosystem here in Minnesota uh, for workforce development that is impressive, but also maybe a little um, unwieldy as far as who is doing what and, and all that thing. So when we're talking about engaging folks with high barriers to employment, we're actually adding, we're talking about adding more to that. So now with workforce development, we're not just talking about down here training and education, but we might be talking about housing services and transit services and health and human services and a social worker. You're making this just a little bit bigger uh, to an already unwieldy system. And so it gets really complex in a hurry. And that's just one of the um, kind of the biggest issues I would say uh, facing workforce development when talking about this particular population. And the last thing I'll say is high school students. So in uh, the Twin Cities, uh, the Seven County Metro and probably metropolitan areas across greater Minnesota, um, maybe you don't think about this as much because you get, uh, have a lot of in-migration of youth into your, uh, into your regions, not as big of a concern. In rural Minnesota, we're essentially fighting back on 20 to 30, maybe even longer, 40 years of telling our kids to leave in order to find opportunity. We're trying to reverse all of that momentum the other way. And there's really two types of influences that folks talk about. One is the relationships that the student have and the observations that the student is making. So workforce development organizations that are working on this piece really have to not just focus on students, but they also have to focus on college admissions, immediate family and formal advisors. Like there's all these people telling the student different things. And are we all on the same message? Are we all saying the same thing? There's also observations, right? So we have career opportunities for students, but also community opportunities. Uh, I think in rural areas, we're talking a lot more about, hey, could we have an honorary city council seat uh, for a high school student to sit on? Um, how do we engage our high school students to take part in some of the planning happening in our communities to kind of put a seed of a positive uh, thing that they might have in their head about their community? These are all becoming more and more important as we think about um, engaging and retaining our youth. So. We talked to a lot of uh, folks in rural Minnesota and they're like, well, we had a regional job fair where all the local employers got together. So the students should know, should be well aware of all the opportunities that are available. And that really isn't the case. Academic literature and I would say some of the work that's being done now is actually showing that it, that's just a small piece of what needs to be going on. We also need to focus on apprenticeships. And I know Tracy Tappany, who's on a panel, uh, can talk a little bit about that, internships. Uh, so with some of our employers, career and technical instruction, that will make perceptions of rural areas among our high school graduates change. It has to be all of that. It can't just be one thing. And there is a ton of activity going on in greater Minnesota. And it's funny, when I was going to high school, uh, career and technical education, CTE, was non-existent. Uh, they just kind of got rid of it. And I was pretty much, you know, you got to go to a four-year college. Um, and that has really been changing, particularly in, in certain areas of the state where we're talking a lot more about career and technical education and really trying to get at those students that maybe never, um, you know, higher education, four-year de uh, degree was never something they were all that interested in, but we're kind of forced to do it. It was either that or, you know, that was that. Um, so this is really trying to engage that side of things and keep those kids uh, in the area with some really great high paying, high skilled jobs uh, that exist in their rural region. The last thing I'll say is we also have um, competition. So it's not that we're just trying to retain our youth from the seven county metro, but we also have initiative taking place uh, in border states that are trying to, I would say, grab our youth. <laughs> uh, Build Dakota scholarships. So this is in South Dakota, um, the state of South Dakota and Oh, I think it's the, the Sanford Foundation, I'm pretty sure, threw in a whole bunch of money into one pot for five years. They were going to fund 300 scholarships, I believe, the first few years, where if any student from Minnesota, South Dakota, Iowa, wherever, were to come to South Dakota Technical College, uh, go into a trade that was of need in that region, and then live and work there for three years, tuition and books were paid. 
uh, and they've been super successful. They've grabbed some students uh, from Minnesota, not a ton yet, but again, there's always this looming kind of, I don't know, like threat or this looming like, look, South Dakota's trying to steal our stuff um, kind of idea. And so really, I think in Minnesota, particularly in Southwest and Northwest, they're starting to have a lot more talk like, look, we have a lot of resources and assets in Minnesota. Why can't we do something like this? Just, just seems so doable for us to do. And so again, it's kind of this idea that like, we're not just kind of trying to keep our young, but we're also trying to box other states out from taking them. So last slide, the big policy implications that we're talking about here from chasing smokestacks to chasing people is you know, we used to be on the job recruitment side of things, which was based on tax incentives, infrastructure investments, and a focus on training labor force. That was really the key foundation of economic development. That is going down the wayside and we're no longer, at least on the ground, talking about that. We still have policy that kind of exists over on this left side yet. Um, it drives me crazy. There's actually still some federal grants in particular where in order to be eligible for it on the application, you have to say, how many jobs will this produce? That's insane um, for Minnesota. If you were in Mississippi or Georgia or Arkansas or something like that, yeah, then that makes more sense because they're not in the same position that we are at. But for Minnesota organizations, there's just no way we can say that what we're trying to do is gonna create jobs. We already have the jobs, we're trying to create people. And so this people recruitment and retention and all this engagement we're doing really comes down to housing programs, child care, visitor strategies, health care, housing, current resident engagement, investments in natural amenities, focus on quality of life issues. These are the key things. The power now rests in uh, labor and uh, amongst workers, and they get to choose where they want to work and live rather than just trying to follow a job uh, and where the best job opportunity is for them because there's just a lot more opportunities than there used to be. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Kate to kind of introduce our panel. I'm excited to hear from all of them. And yeah, Kat, take, uh, Kate, take it away. Yeah, Kelly, thank you so much. You are so gifted at moving through just vast amounts of information in this so um, conversational and easy to follow way. I, I could just listen to you talk about this all day. So thank you so much. Uh, just an awesome uh, awesome dive there and I learned a ton and I'm just really excited for our next step here which is we have a great panel of folks with us and to moderate this excellent panel I'm really pleased that we have Christina Palladino is our moderator for the interconnected series and Christina some of you may know from her career in broadcast journalism she was at Fox 9 um, has more than 15 years of uh, broadcast television journalism right now she's at Park Street Public as a senior principal for public relations and communications and uh, it just has been a great partner in developing and implementing this series as well and so we're really pleased to have Christina with us. Christina I'll turn it over to you to introduce our panel. Great thank you Kate so much I'm so honored to be taking part as the moderator for this second uh, interconnected series talking about all the different uh, landscapes of workforce here in Minnesota. So I'd like to introduce uh, those on the panel. Thank you again for everyone agreeing to be on this panel and this great discussion we're about to have. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Santo Cruz. He is the Senior Vice President and General Counsel of Centra Care in St. Cloud. Next is Lewis King, President and CEO of Summit Academy OIC in Minneapolis. We have Jessica Miller, DEED Regional Workforce Strategy Consultant in Southwest Minnesota, and Tracy Tappany, Co-President of Wyoming Machine Incorporated, and of course, Kelly with the Center for Rural Policy and Development gave us this great uh, presentation just a few minutes ago. So first, I'd like to kind of start off with just a basic question. We're coming out, hopefully, of this pandemic, slowly but surely, more people are returning to the office, you know, kind of getting back into a, a new normal. I'd like to start out with Jessica, just to kind of give us an overview from, from your perspective, how this pandemic has changed the workforce landscape in both the metro and greater parts of Minnesota. I think overall, it's been exciting to see some innovation and our, our employers are pivoting, right? So what was impossible um, the day before became possible the next day. So uh, a complete workforce was, was moved to be uh, mobile overnight. Another exciting thing that I think has taken place is that the, the, pandem the pandemic has shined a spotlight on our 
um, essential workforce, which I think has been able and, and will continue to serve as a beacon for our youth and really showcasing those sectors that are the most important for our Minnesota economy and getting them really excited about going into careers that you know, can withstand the, the storm. So those are two components that I think have been really great. Another piece I think has been awesome is that our employers are really focusing and honing in on retention efforts around flexible scheduling, around um, looking at the time off availability benefits and really looking at their workforce as um, the biggest commodity that they have uh, and, and focusing on celebrating the workforce that they have too. So providing those opportunities for upskilling and um, career pathways within the organizations. I think all of those things have been great. Great. So I think the biggest takeaway for me from Kelly's presentation is that we do not have a job shortage problem. We have a people shortage problem here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, Lewis, I'd like to hand this over to you. How do you think we fix this? How do we tackle this issue uh, you know, based on if you're in the metro area versus in the rural parts of Minnesota? Lewis, looks like you're muted. There. I think, first of all, we have to recognize that we do live in a new world post-pandemic. We've learned that you don't have to live there to work there. You don't have to live there to learn there. And that's very hard for us boomers to accept because we're so used to the face-to-face -face meeting. But look, we have 126 people gathered and we're not together. So that, that along with, uh, of course, that accelerated the tech migration that we were undergoing. And then many of us are getting older. So we're now looking into populations that we didn't see value in previously. So there are uh, essentially three things that I think that's opened up our eyes. One, as I said, location doesn't matter. Two, it's a universal issue that is rural and urban. It's not, you're not special. We have the same problem. And three, there is a skills mismatch. So the people that we have don't always have the skills needed for the jobs. And we now have to turn to seeing them as a critical asset and human capital is, is worth investing in versus an expense. Because there's an expense to not being able to produce and make your business grow. So you are going to have to invest in the people, change some of the rules uh, to meet the demands of the new day. Yeah. Tracy, how do you see this issue? Uh, a, a people shortage, not necessarily a job shortage. Um, I think that that is definitely true. And I think that the data has really borne that out over a long period of time. Um, I would say, though, that uh, one thing I think uh, just a sort of a slight variation on that is that sometimes jobs are in a certain location of the state where there aren't enough people. And sometimes there's a lot of people, but there aren't enough jobs. So there can be that happening across the state at various times. Um, and I think that's something to consider. But without a doubt, it is definitely a shortage of people that we're dealing with right now and attracting people that are sitting on the sidelines and getting them interested in applying for jobs and coming back into the workforce. For sure. There is a general concern that if we don't address the workforce shortage, employers may begin moving their businesses. Tracy, is this something that you're noticing? You own a, a big manufacturing company here. Is this something you're seeing? You know, I think the thing about moving a business out of state, it's a very costly thing to do. And so people, I don't think are going to jump on that as a first choice of strategy. But I do think the thing that I worry most about is that it just stifles the economy of Minnesota. If people cannot fill jobs and we can't do that quickly, we cannot grow our economy to a level where we would like it to be. And that affects all Minnesotans when the economy isn't doing well. Um, but I certainly do agree that there are businesses that would move out of state, um, but it is a lengthy and costly process to do that. And so, you know, acting sooner rather than later to try to deal with these workforce issues means we can retain more businesses here in Minnesota. Santo, I wanted to toss this over to you. You know, we've talked healthcare is a huge industry here in the state of Minnesota. We know there are so many jobs that are available, but just people aren't uh, up to speed on their skills yet. Kind of talk about that from the healthcare perspective and does this really impact that occupation? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, going before uh, the pandemic, I think we had somewhere between 700 and 800 job openings. Uh, right now we have over 1,000 job openings at Centricare. We employ just uh, under 14,000 folks. And our biggest need is that skills gap that Lewis and his academy are taking head on and providing so much value to large employers, particularly, I think, in this new this new phase, uh, will increasingly be to greater Minnesota, uh, because as exactly as he said, you don't have to live there to work there. And I think there are a lot of attractive things about folks who maybe do want to live in a rural setting, but felt like they had to commute into the city and vice versa. So I think that there will be a a new normal, so to speak. Uh, we really take the approach of there are things where we have to partner. So, for example, we make major investments in our local uh, institutions of higher learning, all of them, to make sure that they have uh, the electronic medical record training that will be useful to us. We do uh, our own um, our own X-ray techs, and we run a school at uh, internally, and we have an outreach to Wilmer, Minnesota. So. Uh, these are good paying jobs. These are these are skilled jobs. These are not advanced degree jobs all the time, but we do run the gamut. But absolutely that, that data of we have more jobs than people is something that we live, particularly in greater Minnesota on a daily basis. Lewis, talk about what you're seeing in terms of people coming through Summit. What are their interests? Are they interested in some of the things Santo just talked about? Maybe, you know, working in the metro but living remotely just kind of talk about the trends that you're seeing right now and and what industries people are are interested in so when we cut our teeth it was initially in construction because it was easy entry uh, for people with chemical uh, especially men with criminal backgrounds paid high wages didn't require a four-year degree we've also we've we've now we've now moved to it and we see huge demand or for folks coming into cyber, app development, help desk, and network operations centers. Uh, healthcare, uh, we found that the, the, if you will, the bedpan type jobs have a ceiling that doesn't allow for advancement. And so the medical admin side um, is there, but there are companies like Vault uh, coming online now that are doing the telemedicine thing. I mean, it's a brand new thing everywhere all at once. So what we're seeing is people following other people. That is what I call the ant trail. Uh, the first one comes in and then you show up and they went and got all of their friends. So it takes a while to build it, but IT is catching on. Now the critical thing there is that many of these folks walk past the glass buildings and have no idea what's going on inside. You have to get someone inside, but that's a, a small manufacturer with the precision manufacturing companies or uh, working for one of the Fortune 500s, they go back and tell others. And that's the way it works with the immigrant communities and migration, whether it's from Mogadishu or Chicago, people come here looking for opportunity. I think one of the opportunities that we have is to say there's another stop beyond the Twin Cities that you can work in other places, but we have to build those relationships. And that's why I was excited um, about being here today. Yeah. Let's talk about some of those high barriers to employment that Kelly mentioned in his presentation. Lewis, what are some of the things that you see with some of the folks coming through your programs, uh, those high barriers to employment? The, the first barrier is isolation. Um, there was a book I read years ago, What Colors Your Parachute by Bold, that said your job is in your social network. So whether you're living in greater Minnesota where you don't know anyone that's attached to a job that's several miles away, or you're living in a city and you don't know anyone there, that is a barrier. Whether people want to believe that or not, and the op opportunities are not always equal. The other thing that we see, of course, is the education gap. So in our strategy there is to build the pipeline. We want our kids now to begin to see um, opportunities in STEM as young as five years of age. That's why you see that bus behind me. We put a mobile lab on the streets and I want to share that with Greater Minnesota, establishing STEM districts so children grow up uh, understanding that this is a place they, they can earn a good living without leaving. Of course, too, since they're in high poverty areas, you see a lot of criminal uh, backgrounds and employers now are beginning to take 
a second look, not only at uh, those things, but also some of the other things that they've had um, in terms of hiring requirements. And finally, uh, a small amount of money as was noted earlier is a huge barrier. These are poor people who three to $400 can make a real difference. So things like student success funds, or you know, if you got in your business some kind of employee support, because typically the people you're training or hiring are the leaders in the family and they have um, responsibilities that go beyond just themselves. Yeah. Santo, what are some of the things that you see to high barriers to employment in, in your area? Well, certainly with just our population base, you know, small towns and rural areas, as you heard from uh, Kelly's presentation, uh, we tend to lose that 18 to 30 demographic very quickly. We do see that boomerang effect, though. Uh, I am a product of that. I grew up in a rural area, was in the metro for uh, a great number of years and have recently moved back. So I do think that the, the data is uh, bear, bears out there, but it is, in fact, that skills gap. Um, that skills gap is crucial. Um, wanting to make sure that we are advertising our, our best, uh, putting our best foot forward as an employer of choice. And I think that really pivots into this conversation around uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, because we're not going to um, have a baby boom ourselves out of this problem. It's going to take about 20 years uh, for my youngest daughter to become a member of the workforce, and we don't have 20 years to solve for this problem. So we really do have to make sure that we are not leaving anybody on the sidelines unnecessarily uh, or unfairly. Yeah. You know, we're getting a lot of questions from panelists about, you know, keeping the younger people here in Minnesota and, and keeping those uh, companies. There was some questions about, you know, there's some older uh, owners who are ready to retire and, and sell their businesses, particularly in rural Minnesota, but there's just not that, you know, next younger generation to take over. Tracy, you do a lot of uh, mentorship uh, with, with younger people. What are you seeing um, in terms of, you know, having that younger generation maybe get into the family business or, you know, keep their roots in greater Minnesota? You know, I think that traditionally in manufacturing, um, Manufacturing, especially in the metals industry that I'm in, has been predominantly and still is a white male industry and a lot of older workers. I mean, a very aging workforce. And I think one of the things that we've concentrated a lot on over the last few years is trying to diversify our own workforce, get more women, get more young people. Getting the young people is a very difficult thing, but we have been, I think, really successful at it. I am shocked at the number of people that are in their 20s that are currently working in my plant or in their early 30s. And, you know, I often share with people, when you first start to do that, you have to realize it's not going to be easy. It's not easy for a young person, a single or two people to come into a plant where the workforce is 50 or 60 years old, because it's harder to make friends. It doesn't mean you can't make friends, but you don't have your people there. Um, I remember, you know, years ago, a person that came to work here, um, came to work one day wearing skinny jeans and had a man bun. And when, if you know anything about manufacturing, you know that traditionally we do not work in the plant wearing skinny jeans or man buns. But you know, through open dialogue about the fact that that is a safe and effective thing to wear at work, you know, people kind of got used to it and it was fine. The point being, you have to recognize and talk about the differences between people because it is a real thing and be open enough about it that people start to get comfortable that we have to accept different kinds of people in the plant. And you know, now that we've got this younger workforce here along with our legacy older workers, you know, I notice a great vibe between people, lots of conversation, they're joking, having fun, trading knowledge, uh, learning new language. Um, we have a young person working here who likes to go around and teach people the current language of, you know, calling people your bestie or talking about your fit and everybody's like, what are you talking about? And she's like, your outfit. So it's actually made it a more fun work environment, but it takes a lot of work. Yeah, for sure. This is a question for Jessica. In what ways do you feel state policy is helping or not helping the workforce shortage here? Um, well, I think that we've got a lot of work that we're doing right now on figuring out how to really dig in and speak to today's 
workforce that's that's been displaced. So those that are currently receiving unemployment benefits, we've got uh, work that's going on with our job services professionals who are doing outreach campaigns to link up with those jobs, those, those good jobs now campaign. So like my team is currently working on doing outreach with Minnesota employers and we're gathering all the different job opportunities that are out there. We're feeding that to our job services team members who are then educating those folks who are looking for work or receiving benefits on what jobs are available right in their own backyards. Um, and then they're able to connect then to uh, dislocated worker funds, for example, to upskill that workforce if they're looking at um, maybe changing career paths through identifying what their transferable skills are. So I think that that's where we've been focusing our, a lot of our energy and then also really targeting and identifying those transferable skills and educating um, through various means the workforce that, hey, you know what, you, you might not be able to have this job anymore, but look how you can use your current skill set and match it right into all these other uh, sectors that are hiring. So those are some things that I think that we're doing that are promising right now. You know, we've gotten a few comments and, and questions about, you know, the hospitality industry, summer's coming up, resorts are looking at staff and what they're going to do. This is a big thing in greater Minnesota. Um, just from the deed perspective, you know, what are some of the things being done just to help those folks out? They really have suffered in the last year. Right. So, you know, there are different grant opportunities that have been happening and we've got the restaurant um, program that's launching tomorrow and I can link some different opportunities there that could be some funding for some people. So we know that they're suffering. We know that they're hurting and we, we are trying our best to, to get programs and opportunities out there for people. Um, and I think a lot of it too is just letting the workforce know that they're ready to go and they're looking for people again and, and getting those, those opportunities out there. We know that some of the folks that are currently displaced right now are really wanting to go back to the job that they used to have. You know, Some folks aren't necessarily interested in switching to a different sector. They love their job in the hospitality industry and that's where they wanna go. So um, finding creative ways to access that talent right now is a lot of the work that we're doing and helping provide those, those uh, employers opportunity to get that information out there. Great. You know, one of the things we read about a lot um, is, is women dropping out of the workforce and, and record numbers, particularly women of color. It's been really hard with trying to, you know, navigate childcare and, and keep up jobs with what the pandemic has done. You know, Tracy, you own a, a big business. Just talk about what you're seeing in terms of trying to recruit women, particularly in manufacturing and what else you feel like needs to be done to engage, you know, women and other, other groups to get back into the labor force. Yeah, uh, this is a challenge. I was telling somebody just recently that, you know, based on data that I've seen, I have been working in the manufacturing industry for 27 years. And by the time that I'm probably ready to retire in the next decade, we're going to see virtually no change at all in the number of women that work in this industry. Um, and it's going to continue to be a white male industry. So that tells me there's lots of work to do and something isn't working quite right. From my own perspective in terms of strategy, just like I said about young people working um, in the plant, getting women into the plant, um, if you don't have very many of them already, is also a challenge because it is a male work environment where people might use certain language, talk about certain things that isn't really inclusive of all people that might want to work in that environment. Sometimes people can express kindness to new coworkers, especially females, in ways that I think aren't meant to um, imply anything other than being kind and wanting to welcome someone, but they make you feel uncomfortable. And I give an example of having to deal with a situation once um, years ago where a woman kept getting donuts from people in the morning, but no one else got a donut. You know, the people that were buying the donuts didn't give it to any of the men that worked there, and it creates an uncomfortable situation. So you got to be willing to tackle that head on. I think that women need to know that they have equal opportunity to be successful. Um, we continue to hear from women that come to work here that in some manufacturing companies right here in Minnesota, if you're working in production, they don't allow women to get a forklift driver's license. I mean, I, I don't even think that's um, a legal thing to do, but it's absurd to think that someone would say in 2020, a woman should not be able to drive a forklift. So I think continuing, again, just like with young people, bringing people in, providing the support, having the difficult conversations that people need to have, 
and making sure that women know that they have an equal opportunity to be successful in a manufacturing environment. And they're wanted here. For sure. And Lewis, talk about the program that Summit is doing to really target you know, women in, in construction and manufacturing. You've had some success with that. Absolutely. Um, we began with Women Wear Hard Hats too. Uh, years ago, uh, just to get them into the construction industry, and we found them in you know all age bracket. Uh, you know, Tracy's right. You know, some of the attitudes on jobs and those things are difficult initially, but you know that takes leadership. Um, I was I was an army officer for ten years, and we went from a segregated army and you know. Uh, Black officers only leading black troops, so you commanded everybody. And it, it, it starts at the top. And you got to talk to your leaders. You also got to go down on the ground and let folks know um, that we can't keep churning people. They're the future of the company. So we've managed to establish that ant trail where the women go home and tell others this is the way in, which is how people operate. We like to complicate matters. But if, if I go home and say they really treat me well, when I see an opener, I'll bring you down, you know, or if I go home and say, hey, this is a terrible place to work. I'm looking for a way out. That's it, it sticks. And we've been able to get women now into uh, our IT programs um, and the construction programs and because of our electricians uh, into manufacturing. But it, it all began with leadership at the company and then us helping the women to have the skills uh, to go into it. And now this food service thing, I think there's been an absence of leadership around that. And, you know, we're stepping up to let people know, especially in the African American community, there are other things that you can do that do not require a four year degree. And by the way, your daughter is watching. So the example that you set, and as a father of three daughters, the example that you set is the example that they follow. So we don't have to give them dolls. We can give them chemistry sets and other things to do or take them to the plant. I mean, all those types of things to set the expectations. And I want to, you know, challenge Tracy. I think we can get it done quicker in 20 years if we, if we uh, accept the fact that we're on a wartime uh, footing. We need to get there. And this is a universal problem. It's not going to get any better. Yeah, that's great points. You know, Kelly talked about um, our immigration system and, you know, how we have a lot of uh, people from different countries who live here and, and have, you know, made jobs here and families here. Santo, healthcare is a very diverse industry. Talk about just some of the challenges you find in recruiting, you know, people that are interested in that field but may not know kind of the next step to, to get into it. Yeah, I think that um, if I were to have an insight I think that could be valuable to folks who are trying to be more inclusive uh, recruiters, I would say your recruitment will probably take care of itself the moment you start focusing on it because that talent is there. Really the thing to focus on for the future is your retention. Uh, Lewis said it just earlier, you can't have the churn. And I think that if you really want to take kind of a, a real inward look of what is your retention rate of the uh, talent that you pull from a diverse population or an unrepresented minority? Um, we're in a very diverse community in St. Cloud. We have pockets of diversity around uh, areas that we serve around the state, but it's largely a, a white population. Um, we don't have any issues finding diverse or white uh, people to apply for jobs, but we do have a problem retaining our diverse uh, our diverse hires. And to the extent that we um, want to become more serious about that, we've continued to focus more and more on what are our retention strategies to keep these folks inside of our, of our organization. Yeah, we've got a question from one of the panelists that says, you know, Lisa Thompson, what are employers outside the Metro doing to help their traditional white male workforce embrace a more diverse workforce and attract those type of people. Um, 
I don't know if Tracy, you kind of want to reflect on that a little bit. That's, you know, you know I'm going to, I'm going to give you an example of that a few years ago, um, not in the very, I mean, in the recent past, um, the state of Minnesota made a grant to Pine Technical Community and College, Pine Technical and Community College, which we work with. And it was to train 80 women from rural communities in welding, and they were low income women. And we've had women in and out of welding over the years. Um, you know, they're perfectly capable of doing that kind of work, but this was going to be a larger group. We had an opportunity to give tours over the period of a year to every single woman who participated in that program. They came to Wyoming Machine, and I have a highly skilled welder here, um, and I said to him, you know, you're going to have to adjust your hours to make these tours work, but I would like to ask that you be the one to participate with me and give these tours because these women could really use your help understanding the work environment um, and what kind of things they're going to face when they go in for a welding test and job interviews and so on and so forth. And when I first told him this, he said, there is no way that that is going to work. And I'm like, you know, come on, just work with me here. And by the time we finished that, not only had he provided amazing advice to these women on how they would find jobs and how they could deal with an interview, we actually started doing all of their weld testing here at Wyoming Machine. They came here and weld tested with my lead welder to prepare for what it would be like if they went somewhere else and did that. And, you know, I think through those kind of actions as an employer, uh, you know, for what I did of just saying, come on, humor me, work with me, we'll do this side by side. By the time it was done, we actually offered jobs to a couple of those women because he said they're going to do a great job and they'll be able to do things. And Pine Technical Community and College actually gave him an award at the end of this for stepping up to help people. So I think it's, it's working on just changing people's perceptions one step at a time. You know, in my company, it is a little bit different too because we have two female owners in the company. And so they're pretty used to that. <laughs> and, you know, they're used to me being on the shop floor doing stuff and, you know, getting in and getting dirty. So um, we do have an advantage over some people. Jessica, maybe you could reflect on this. Do you think people or do you have any data that's coming in that people are going to be returning more and more to the office? Or do we think remote work is, is here to stay and kind of changing the landscape in Minnesota? Any sort of early indication of, of where things are going? I, I do not have any specific data to provide you, but I know I'm seeing more and more emails of our partners that are coming back to the workforce or coming back into the office. But absolutely, remote work is here to stay. I think that it'll probably end up being very much a hybrid because information is coming in through surveys that some of our workforce really likes being at home, but some of them really miss that human interaction and being in the office. Um, but I think that this, I think that the pandemic has definitely changed the landscape of what the future of work is going to look like in a lot of different ways, and that is for sure one of them is that employers are are being nimble and providing opportunities in in that regard. Yeah, so that kind of leads to my next question. We've got a few comments from from panelists so just about you know housing, um, whether it's in the metro or in Greater Minnesota. Some people said they they couldn't find a house in Greater Minnesota, but there was possibly a job that they like, so that was kind of an issue. They're kind of waiting to see when they can afford a house. I don't know if Santo, you want to weigh in. Are you seeing that at all? That you know, housing issues are tying into you know, where they work and if remote work is going to play into that at all? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I've been involved with um, uh, the Minneapolis Fed's work with the Atasca project on housing and really the cost burden population. Those folks spending 30% uh, or more of their, of their income on their housing and it is really a, a real crisis for folks to be able to find that housing, um, whether it be rental or, or you know, multi-family uh, dwellings or single-family dwellings. That first-time home buyer, and we see it in you know in in outstate Minnesota as much as you see the kind of crazy prices uh, that we don't see in Greater Minnesota. You know, if I read the Star Tribune or some other publication, you know, you see the median house, you go, well, that's not what they have out here. Nevertheless it's not as though there's a bunch more houses available for sale in greater Minnesota uh, and, and, and vice versa. So I think that that's a huge crunch. Uh, we hear it from everyone from our doctors that move to the area, 
to uh, facility workers and you name it. Housing is a major, major component. And we just need an increase of supply. Um, you know, we're trying to do our best with bringing wages up. We're above $15 an hour. Um, but that still isn't enough at the outpacing of what's going on with the housing market. And for those of you who are looking at, you know, the, the, the rates on, on, uh, on mortgages and saying, well, that, that's wonderful. My goodness, look at the cost of supplies. You know, what, what, you, what you're saving in the long term on your, on your financing right now, uh, good luck trying to get, a, get um, uh, the supplies needed to do that construction. It's become very, very expensive. Uh, so construction is booming. I know that they need a lot of workers as well. And I think that construction is an area that people typically don't think about with healthcare, but it actually is in terms of we are both part of the solution and part of the problem of those materials being so expensive because we do need to build those facilities to, to provide those services. And those construction workers are looking for more people to swing those hammers and to, and to uh, install those wires. And I was just going through one of our uh, units today where that's the case. So there's a lot going on in the construction industry that's really stretching that industry to the point where do they build housing? Uh, what price point is it at? And there's just not enough labor and currently not enough materials to really go around. Yeah. There's a couple comments uh, just about, you know, the emphasis on the older worker and, you know, will, will uh, the pandemic kind of include flexible options uh, for them moving forward? Jessica, any reflection just from what you're hearing and seeing of companies around the state of, you know, how they'll prioritize older workers? Absolutely. I think um, at first there was this wave of, of folks feeling like they needed to retire because there was a fear of the pandemic. However, um, now we're seeing that there's vaccinations out there and people are, are getting vaccinated and, and they're wanting to return back to the workforce. Employers definitely are shifting their um, scheduling options to accommodate not only our older workforce, but our parents who might want family friendly hours or maybe there's different shift opportunities for on call hours or even hiring our younger workforce as well. So there is definitely a shift to be more accommodating based on the needs of, of the potential workforce that they're recruiting for. So definitely a shift in that regard. We have a question. Can the panelists talk about the Opportunity Zone program in rural communities? Tracy, do you want to weigh in on this one? You know what? I am not going to be able to help with that because we do not have an Opportunity Zone where I am. And so I'm not intimately familiar with that. Okay. Santo, is that something that you guys participate in at all? I saw a couple of questions about it, so I thought I'd bring it up. You know, I, I know that we do get involved with the Workforce Center locally, and I don't know specifically, um, you know, if it's a true, if it's a true uh, opportunity zone as, in terms of the official designation, but in terms of do we work locally uh, and partner locally with, uh, with our partners, we have something locally called the GSDC, the Greater St. Cloud Growth Corporation that uh, is very similar to Greater MSP, that envy that uh, that Kelly was talking about earlier in his presentation. It, I think it's one of the, the products of that locally. So we do do a lot of work around that, but maybe I need a little bit more specific information about how it is that we collaborate and work with those different opportunity zones. Sure. Another uh, question was, our, uh, somebody had said their workforce board has the same uh, type of a program called matchmaking. So basically you match older business owners ready to retire to younger entrepreneurs looking to take over. I kind of think this is an interesting uh, initiative. Anybody kind of want to weigh in on if, if that's something they've talked about or something that could potentially help with this, you know, retaining young people here? I would just say that in a business like mine, because it's very capital intensive with equipment and whatnot, you know, depending on the kind of assets the person comes with, it can be hard to buy a business like mine just because there are a lot of assets that have to be acquired in order to do that. And you don't, we don't typically see young people even entering this industry as business owners. And I think because of the capital requirements. For sure. So where do we go from here? What's, what are some of the kind of uh, last thoughts and, and, comments that you think you know people participating and listening should take to heart in terms of 
you know, skills they need to have, or how do they how do they pivot to make themselves valuable in this workforce moving forward? Santo, you know, I I think that there's a ton of opportunity that came from the disruption of COVID nineteen. There's no doubt about that. I think though the the word I want to offer to folks because I think that there's a lot of excitement around things that will be here to stay. Telemedicine, telework. Um, I think there will be major infusions in broadband uh, access for greater Minnesota and for really rural America. So I think a lot of things are going to end up getting solved and a lot of pillars will be, get in pla be put in place that, to be honest with you, will fundamentally change the kind of course and the way we solve for these type of labor issues in the future. However, I do want to put just one word of caution out there of why we have to still be careful, and that is... Um, we work and serve exclusively greater Minnesota and oftentimes we are in fact almost exclusively we are the largest employer where we're at and as we start saying we can work anywhere be anywhere what's going to happen when that town that has a very fragile local economy and a very fragile infrastructure starts ha having to actually compete with metro or people from around the country for those jobs that actually bring that income to the community that keep that local ecosystem going. So if a town of a thousand people or less uh, suddenly is in competition with the local hospital jobs that can be done you know, uh, through telemedicine or telework or things like that from all over the country, we really have to be careful that, we're, that small towns in rural America, rural Minnesota are already vulnerable and fragile economic ecosystems to the extent that we bring that global competition to Main Street, we have to do that very thoughtfully to actually strengthen the local hometown rather than to actually take it apart. Tracy, any, any last uh, thoughts here for folks tuning into this webinar? You know, I have a, a couple of thoughts in there based on things that I saw going through in the comments. One has to do with ecosystems. Um, I served one term on the Governor's Workforce Development Board and I remember you know, during that time, I was really excited because we were talking a lot about on ramps and off ramps to different training opportunities. And I thought that's a, you know, awesome idea. And I, I still think it's, it's not like I think it's a bad idea. But I think we've come to a time where thinking about workforce training and, you know, job skills has more to do with an ecosystem. Um, and when I think about, you know, manufacturing, for example, manufacturing and construction have a lot of similarities to them as well as some other jobs. You know, there's physicality, there's using tools, there's uh, working with other people to get things done. And, you know, if workers with those similar kind of interests and skills were in a broader ecosystem, it might be easier for them to shift from one career to another because there's similar skills, similar interests, so on and so forth. And I think it would be a good idea for us to start talking and thinking about that more as possibly a way to speed up training of people and changing careers as demand changes. Um, the second thing is I saw someone make a comment about our, our workforce system being very employer centered. And I do think that is true. I mean, it really is driven by employer needs and that is gonna continue to be critically important. Um, but at the same time, more input and participation from those being trained could probably benefit all of us. Um, and we would have to be chasing less time chasing down the people that we want to get into training opportunities if they were already part of the workforce development system if that makes sense so i think there's something to think about there as well lewis just a quick uh, wrap of just any lasting thoughts for folks i think that uh our approach has to be around three things one um the children we have to see them as the workers of tomorrow and workers of the future uh, much in the same way as professional sports puts the ball in a boy's hand by the time he's four and then brings him through all the systems. We've got to do that more intentionally. Secondly, I think that uh, we want to attract folks to come to our communities, whether it's in greater Minnesota or, or Minneapolis. And then when they get there, we cannot isolate them socially. And we have to develop the skills to embrace them and advance them, uh, and this is serious. You you have to view it as really about the survival of the uh, community. I'll give a one 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 story to kind of share the light. A few years ago, I saw a kid get a buzzer beater uh, full court right at the end. Um, it turned out he was a Somali kid, and I was like, which 
which high school in the Twin Cities is that? It was not. It was a small town in Southern Minnesota. And this kid put that town on the map and clearly had been integrated into the extracurricular sports. And I think we gotta think like that. How do we attract people uh, to our communities and then embrace them when they get there so that they will bring others and that will be the key to our success. Great. And Jessica, anything quickly before we wrap? Yep, I definitely agree my, with, with Lewis there. Resident recruitment is absolutely got to be a focus on every community in the state of Minnesota and every employer in the state of Minnesota to really figure out how to be inclusive and welcoming to all. Great. Well, thank you all so much for participating in this. I thought it was a great, diverse discussion and again, honored to have moderated it. Kate, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Christina. And thanks again to all our panelists for being with us today. Just great insights, stories, examples from all around the state. Just really loved it. And uh, I know the recording of this is going to be online, right, through the Center for Rural Policy and Development on YouTube. So uh, if anyone attending today has folks in their network who you think would like to hear uh, this program, you can definitely share that afterward. I think we have our next date set, sort of, right, Julie? <laughs> we, is it June? Third, we uh, uh, do. It's June third. Yep, June Thursday, June third. It's great being able to say June. That means nice weather. But yep, June third, two thirty in the afternoon, and we're going to be talking about healthcare access. And so, um, it, it's going to be great. Awesome. Thanks again to our panelists, to Christina for moderating, Kelly for the presentation and all the great research. Appreciate everyone's contributions today and enjoy the beautiful day. Go outside. <laughs> all right. Take care. Thanks, everyone.